little delay going live there. We got the we got the ranges coming down here. We just got an aerial flood watch. Oh boy, that's pretty scary. So welcome to the uh, joke writing challenge. Uh, those of you guys here, drop in the chat that you uh, that you can hear me okay. Also, uh, those of you who may be joining the live broadcast, don't be afraid to put in there what also, your. Uh, those of you who may be joining oh, we're gonna get an echo here. Don't be afraid to put in there what your. Stand by as I check on this audio. Stand by as I check on this audio. There we go. That's better. No, 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 no echo. Then it's like a, we used to call on the radio stations. They'd be like, uh, uh, "Will you turn down their radio?" That's better. All right. So we're live. We've got some people checking in here. Um, we're actually it said, let's go. I'm ready, Frank says. We got Kevin here. Uh, what up, joke doctor? Uh, it's let's uh, it's, let's go. I just shaved twice. Uh, we got Cannon here. Uh, Cannon's jumping in. Good. Let's get the we'll get started here with uh, some of these stuff. Now, what I would like you to do is if, for example, if today we get um, if today we have a um, uh, if I miss your jokes, if evidently yesterday I missed some jokes uh, for some people. If I miss your jokes, make sure you just let me know in the chat. I'll try to monitor that chat better. Um, using a kind of a dual screen here to keep track of that and see what uh, see what you guys are saying on the other end and also use this opportunity to check in in that chat let people know where you're from introduce yourself uh, drop your socials in um, connect with people any the, one of the best things about these types of events is that we get to connect with other like-minded people building relationships is key to your success in this business and any business like in this business Everything that gets made or gets done gets done because of a relationship that was in place. So don't be afraid to uh, to to connect with people that way. Uh, let's um, let's get this presentation up and running, and then we'll just go through some of these jokes. Uh, also, in the comments, uh, if you have any suggestions, like uh, for for improvement or uh, things like that, don't feel free to drop those into the chat because. I'm always looking to get, uh, you know, try to hit up some things, uh, answer the questions you guys have, give you more of what you need uh, type of thing. So uh, if you like these uh, events, let me know. And then um, that way we can we can really start to to improve them and have some uh, have have a good time together. We got Anna from Florida. Hey, we got your weather over here, Anna. It's like we got tropical rain, which is so unusual. It's, it's weird to get rain in Southern California and that you could feel it, the, the humidity within the rain. And you know, it's tropical as opposed to just regular sort of dry weather rain. Um, so it's, uh, it's all a different experience here right now. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to pop this presentation up on the screen. This is where the jokes are going to be. And then, um, and then we'll, uh, then we'll get started. Okay. I was uh, impressed with, uh, first of all, the first round of jokes that came through was super uh, it, it, exciting because there was like so many jokes. I mean, some of you guys popped in, uh, t you know, 10 jokes, 20 jokes on the same headline. This is a great exercise for that reason. It teaches you to get outside your comfort, zo comfort zone and start pumping out jokes. Um, and the more jokes you pump out, the better you get at it. Not, you know, even if you're only going to use one or three, the more jokes you have to choose from, the more volume you create, the better odds for you to create that one golden joke that's going to really pop and, and get some, get a big response. In, um, in the late night rooms, in the writing rooms, most, and especially in late night TV, most writers produce like 25 to 40 jokes a day. That's 25 to 40 jokes per day. Um, uh, I was cranking out about 80 to 120 because of the, the process and system I used that I was taught by a couple of guys who were head writers in, in rooms for years. And they really pushed me to hit those numbers. Uh, so 
just so you know, this is a, this is, these are techniques that you guys can use. And um, let's see, are we still, uh, my, looks like my video froze here. I wonder what's happening. Are we, uh, am I on? Yeah, I hope so. Let's see. It says, it looks like the live had, has stopped over here. Oh, hold on. Nope. I guess the, maybe just the video. All right. Um, let's see if I get in here. And what I'll do is make sure that you guys can see me. I'll choose this one right here. Let's see if that changes it. All right, good. Let's get back to it. This one's on the screen. Okay. So um, let me let me double check and ask you guys if you can still see the broadcast. Am I still coming through on your end? Is my internet? My internet seems to still be on. It's just like yesterday it popped off, you know, just before the live stream. So, and let's see. I'm not seeing anything from you guys in the in the uh, in the chat. And right now this is not showing that it's live. Let me see. There we're back. Where well, there it is. Now it's showing that it's live. So I guess we're we're on. Let's do this. So Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Uh, number one, I'll tell you tell you this headline surprised me. Isn't Chipotle about real is better, better for you, better for the people, better for our planet? I don't imagine robots fit into that. Well, wouldn't it be weird if the CEO of Chipotle's? Uh, let's see. So we do that. That's. Kind of a, I like the dis, finding the disconnect here, Michael. Great idea. It is true. That's their theme. Now, um, and you say, so, is it, and I like the way you ask this question. Isn't Chipotle about real is better? That's kind of their motto, their kind of slogan, right? Real is better for you, better for the people, better for our planet. I don't, I don't imagine robots fit into that. You know, how real is a robot? I like that finding that disconnect there. Uh, wouldn't it be, there might be a better joke to have in there, uh, instead of like, how would you say real is better if it's, um, if it's, you know, basically a machine doing it, uh, wouldn't it be weird if the CEO, uh, is if the CEO of Chipotle introduced a new campaign for real 2.0 and the new tagline would be real is better, better for you, better for people, better for our planet. And let's not forget better for the robots. He said, sing this part. So I did. Uh, number three, uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Well, I also figured out how to spoil my wife for her upcoming birthday. I'm going to get her all-natural robot made of guac as a birthday cake. The kind of different way to pivot that joke. I don't know where it, it came from, but, uh, you know, it, it came, sort of came out of left field. Uh, technically, now, sometimes within... The, when you're doing late night jokes, the key is to use the puzzle that's set up for us, the word puzzle that's set up for us, and choose some event within the world word to pivot to. In this case, uh, this gave an inspirational idea to pivot to, which was uh, to relate it to your marriage and the the relationship with your wife, which is an interesting pivot. So uh, for for late night. A TV. It depends on if you if you're writing it for that purpose. You'd be writing for a specific host, right? So the we'd be hoping that the um, that the you know that the audience would understand uh, the host's re you know reaction and the host's uh, relationship with their with their wife. Does that make sense? Um, so let's see what uh, what's happening right now. None of you guys sort of popped into the chat that you could still hear me. So it. Um, I hope that it's uh, you guys are hearing me. Um, and, oh, and Anna's from, Anna from Panama is that uh, that's wild. Yeah, we're in a different country. That's awesome that you're coming from Panama. Yep, you can hear. Good. Somebody said I can hear. Good. Sounds good. Audio's good. Because it was weird for a while. It wasn't popping through. All right. So now let me uh, let me pop. I gotta pop back out of this um, out of this presentation here because. I'm all the way at the end. I'll get back to the front of it. So let me get uh, let me get out of here for a second, and we'll pop that out of there. We'll be back as I set this up properly. Apologies, but just before we are, I was ready to live stream, my daughter came in. We got a we got a an alert on our phone. Are we okay? 
So it's like, yeah, we're fine. It's just uh, as Southern California freaks out when it rains. We'll be good. And here we go. All right, that's better. Let's get back to this now. There we go. That's better. There we go. These are, okay, so then we'll put this in presentation mode so everybody can see that nice and clear. There we are. All right, so uh, let's go back to um, this one. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Being a Chipotle manager is the loneliest job in the world. They get a Roomba to clean the restaurant, self-checkout to pay, and now the automatic waitress to serve. Uh, so it, And the automatic waitress to serve. Gladly, no HR claims for robotic harassment. Uh, I, so... That you can't that even be more specific with that. It's like I wonder if you can still get uh, sent to HR for sexual harassment with a robot, something like that, right? So it's like no HR claim for robotic harassment. If you're gonna say sexual harassment, say sexual harassment and say it's sexual harassment with the robot, because um, that would be now. What would that look like? Now you can like now you say now you put those ideas together and you use the improv technique. If this is true, what else could be true? And now that's an, that's an interesting idea, this uh, sexual harassment with a ro robot. And the reason why is because it's in the, your imagination. It's not really happening, you know. Um, or what if, this, what if the robot becomes the sexual harasser, you know. Um, <laughs> so, it, like, that could be a, a – that, what, that, what would that look like? It's like now somebody had an interesting joke, and I think we'll be investigating that soon um, with what – the name, the original name for avocados are, it's an old Aztec uh, word. And it's like, um, I think this is actually Tom, Tom Sharp wrote a joke on that. And he puts together the idea of like what the uh, avocados original word in Aztec also meant testicle. Somebody in yesterday's live stream said it's an old Native American word meaning testicle. Now, I didn't know whether he was placing this as a fact or a joke. So... But it turns out it is a fact. When you're going to say a, something that sounds crazy or sounds radical as a real true fact, let the audience know. I mean, there are some there are some coaches and cl or club owner that says, oh, don't ever say, oh, this is actually true. Of course, say that if it's actually true. There's no special rules in comedy except for where we, we communicate, right? We have to have certain we have to have certain structures to hide some jokes if necessary, not to reveal the jokes too early. But as far as like when people say, oh, don't pause too much, don't don't use a question, uh, don't um, say uh, this is actually true, don't laugh during your jokes and like that. All of that's absurd unless you're laughing because it joke's not funny and you're trying to get the audience to laugh because you don't have a funny joke but other than that you can deliver that joke so in this case sometimes people say don't don't uh, say it's actually true in this case you need to say it's a you know did you know this is actually true uh the word for avocado is an old aztec word uh that means testicle see now now it makes sounds like it comes from a place of authority rather than you're trying to make it a, a gag, right? So make sure you're clear in your communication with your audience because now once you introduce that idea that testicle avocado are one and the same, now we can have some fun, right? So I'm surprised that, uh, that now the, av the avocado is actually playing with people's balls and now you can maybe have a joke there. You can allude to that and that's when it becomes funny. Because that's massive incongruity. You know, you're making an avocado and it's actually, the word for avocado is actually an Aztec word meaning balls. And that's where you can have, have a laugh, right? So now you introduce the new concept in the setup to allow the audience to participate in that, 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 that gag, right? Does that make sense? Um, so what did one robot say to the other robot? Blow my chips, microchips. He was immediately fired. So <laughs> I'm not sure where blow my chips comes from. Blow my chips, meaning your microchips, right? But, but why would a robot say that to another robot? 
And it's like, but it's still the idea. What maybe there's another phrase in there that would pay off uh, for that line about how robots might communicate sexually to each other. Um, so uh, nice job there. Bob submitted some extras. He submitted yesterday, but since we're doing it a second day, he decided to put himself to the task and write some more. So um, and some of uh, some other uh, guys out there have as well. I'm really happy about that. So. Um, and by the way, anytime while during the stream, if you get an inspiration for another joke that might tag somebody else's joke, by all means, drop it into the chat. The more you write, the more you get better. That's it. Don't ever be afraid to help another comedian tag or top another joke because it's actually benefiting you in your skill set. The more you write, the more you help, the more you write, the more you get better uh, with your own skill set. So uh, keep that in mind. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Chipotle is te uh, so this involves a robot driving a steamroller over several crates that contain avocados and uh, unavoidable insects. The bugs uh, have yet to be worked out. It's like, I see. Now, go ahead and explain this. Right. So if this avocado, if you read the story, if you got in and read a little more of the story besides just the headline, which I suggest to everybody, you always hear me say, do not be a headline skimmer. Get in there and check out the story. Sometimes the real joke is hiding in the first one or two paragraphs of a story. Um, I'll give you an example. Stephen Colbert was doing a joke about a kid who graduated magna cum laude in Florida. And... Um, so his mom wanted to bake him a cake or wanted to buy him a cake from Publix grocery store and that said, congratulations, magna cum laude. Now, um, since cum is spelled C-U-M, Publix grocery store would not accept that in their computer algorithm. They said, no, we will not make that cake because it's dirty. You know, it's nasty. It's obscene. So they were like, uh, so she had to call him and explain to him that no, cum is a Latin word. It means, you know, with, with you know, honors. Uh, so she, they were like, uh, uh, no, we still won't make it that way. So Stephen Colbert made him cupcakes that say magna cum laude. But the real essence of the joke, if the writers were vigilant enough to get in there and not skim the headline, was that the kid was actually homeschooled. So he got magna cum laude because he was competing against nobody, right? So, uh, but his mom wanted to make him a cake that was magna cum laude, right? So she probably also did his projects, projects for him and submitted them to herself, who I guess she's the homeschool teacher. But that was the gag, right? The gag is hidden in the actual disconnect that the kid was homeschooled, not he wasn't in a public school. So, uh, or in a, in a, in another, in a school with competitors, he, with other students, but they, they didn't find that, but they made these cupcakes for a kid who was homeschooled. I was like, God, you made, just made fools of yourselves. Anyway, so get in there and read the story and find out more information. So in this case, the, it's like the, the autocado will actually takes 25 pounds of avocados at, at a single time and can peel them, pit them, process them for, for, um, uh, cut them, uh, pro peel, cut them, pit them, peel them, and, pro and so they can be processed for for guacamole. Now, uh, in this case, uh, it, if you're taking crates of avocados and the robots taking them and s smashing them to make guacamole, it's like of course, they can't sort out the insects because the it's not that bright of a robot. So imagine the the extra protein we're getting with our uh, guacamole. If you just sort of explain that to the audience, that's where the joke will be. Sometimes we're working so hard on economy that we forget to put in uh, essential information. So I just want to make sure you, you guys do that. Uh, so Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Chipotle, um, unfortunately, due to supplier issues, the testing involves uh, avocados and an engineer named Bob wrapped in tinfoil, wailing a sledgehammer in his, in his version of guaca mole uh okay got it uh whack whack-a-mole whack-a-mole i like that good you dug in there for that whack-a-mole so what if you took what if you said instead of like sneaking that up on us right instead of like um pretending we know this information you've heard of whack-a-mole you know well this, in this case it's a robot with a wheel a sledge handing ha, uh, sledge uh, hammer wielding robot and he's playing uh, uh guacamole guacamole that could be that could be a fun play there now we now we picture whack-a-mole right whack-a-mole guacamole 
And it's like, and it's like now you can do that wordplay there. Give us the real one first. That's called a cliche workaround. Sometimes giving us the real version of it so that we can then see your play on it, which is what a coincidence. Whack-a-mole is spelled the same. Whack-a-mole is spelled the same as guacamole. And oh, now we got it. Now you have to figure out which way to say it, which way would work best to get, to make the joke work across um, the, the you know to the audience. So I like this idea though, uh, going from whack-a-mole to guacamole. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Time savings from the results of the robot delivering guacamole from a nearby Mexican restaurant. A report reported upgrade to the robot will hopefully allow delivery without an attitude. All right. Nice job there, Ron. Uh, keep it going. Keep uh, uh, keep taking these things and taking the puzzle, breaking it apart, putting it back together. That's how you write uh, jokes. Also, one of the better way to write jokes for this particular line. Now, the reason why I chose this line is because within the headline, you have multiple different ideas converging. So the definition of a joke is two dissimilar ideas converging. So here we have Chipotle, a known brand, recognizable. People are familiar with it. People have emotions or feelings about Chipotle one way or another, especially since the E. coli break out to 14 or 13 states. So um, now it is uh, Chipotle is testing a robot. So big, big name here, robot, Chipotle, are those two incongruous ideas? ideas yes uh, especially since chipotle's sort of theme is all natural right so better for you better for the planet uh and then like can make guacamole so that's the third one so third and then there's a fourth idea in uh, in half the time as a human employee so you have a lot of things going on but when you do wind up hitting the punchline it winds up being an incongruous relationship between two ideas so because you can't have four ideas being presented to the audience in the punchline because it just the brain won't be able to connect those you can do those in tags and toppers but not in, the, in just a single punchline so just keep that in mind so I would then make a list, everything I can think about related to Chipotle or rest, Chipotle and restaurants, and then everything I can think about related to robots or computer technology. And right there, you're going to have combinations. One of the jokes that Joseph put out yesterday uh, was similar to one of the ones I had, uh, but we just used two different versions of a word. So when you have computers, what do you have? You have computer chips. And so uh, you know, guacamole. So the only thing is, he said he said he said something like uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. The only uh, the only problem is you can those chips uh, those uh, the guacamole is only served with microchips. And so I thought that was a really good joke. It's real specific. And I had uh, some some version of that. And I said the words computer chips. So. But that was done. I wouldn't have gotten to that joke because computer chips didn't show up on my list until down 18 or 20 down the down the associative list line. So when it, but when you see that that word there because it's written, all of a sudden you start seeing connectors all over the place to help you build out those jokes. Um, so Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Wow, impressive, uh, impressive. Why doesn't someone invent something useful like a bot that can respond to my old lady when she says, honey, we need to talk. That would be way better than some guacamole slinging R2-D2. Cha-ching, that's John. John put some jokes um, in yesterday that were funny. John is like, you could almost tell that he, this character he's delivering from has an attitude, a real heavy, sarcastic attitude. So who, what, what late night host has that heavy, sarcastic attitude? Um, if it was delivered as a character, I could maybe see uh, Stephen Colbert likes to do those. But maybe if um, Jimmy Fallon did an impression of somebody, like, no, dude, like, you know, it's like, uh, maybe, you know, what, why doesn't someone invent something useful like a bot that can respond to my old lady when she says, honey, we need to talk. That would be way better than some guacamole singing, slinging R2-D2, right? And I see the attitude in there is presented the joke. Um, that's a good, good, good joke. Very creative, John. Um, I like that. And I always like that cha-ching afterwards. Uh-oh, we just had a minor earthquake. Wow, wait a second. Are we getting storms, hurricane, and earthquake at the same time? California's going to the water. That's what's, what's happening. But if, if you wind if I start doing this under bubbles and I'm like, you know, I'll keep going if I'm underwater because I love this stuff. Anyway, so let's, um, let's, uh, nice, nice work on that joke. 
moving on to Cliff. Cliff has uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can b- make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Uh, they hope to have the robots up and running faster than the employees run to the bathroom after eating at Chipotle. Nice, Cliff. Working in the already known or familiar idea that Chipotle had that issue with E. coli and people, all kinds of people had diarrhea. So um, since th- that information is embedded into that, I in already into the branding of Chipotle, you can have a fun time with that. Isn't it weird that uh, Chipotle's branding, it's like uh, the it, real is better, uh, better for the planet, better for you, that sort of idea is, um, is, is that uh, the, the brand of diarrhea and E. coli is much more well-known than their actual slogan. So I think that's kind of interesting, too. Good work on that joke clip, by the way. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. While test results have been promising, engineers say they need more time into developing their microchips and salsa. Boom. Nice job there. You see microchips and salsa? So proud of you for coming up with that. I don't have a name on that one. I only had an email, so I don't. I can't give you give, give you credit. Uh, but uh, And do yourself a favor. This goes to everybody, all writers. The reason you see me put your full name, if it's, it was available to me on the email, in the, on the card, is you, it is your intellectual property. You have to let people know you own that. Got it? All right? So, um, so that's why I'm proud to put those names on there, because you should be proud to have those names on there when you're creating intellectual property like this. And this goes with anybody. Anytime you submit a packet, you submit a script, you submit uh, something to, uh, you know, a commercial parody or something to a radio station, always be sure your name is at least in the footer, in the header. Uh, and I usually say, say in the footer of each page, even though Stephen Colbert's room doesn't want you to put it on the footer of each page. They just want a header sheet. But if you are like submitting hard copy paper, now, all their submissions were taken via email at the time when they were looking for new writers, right? So it's not now digital, so your name is going to be attached to it. But if you were submitting paper uh, and, it, and they don't want staples and one of those pages got loose and they've got 100 entries, your page is now sitting on the floor with a brilliant joke, concept, or sketch, and they can't identify you. So this is one reason why you always be sure to put your names on there. So with this, next time you send out or participate, please put your name on there. Be proud of the, the material you're presenting. Um, so microchips, great joke. Uh, they named the robot E. coli. Good joke. I had a joke uh, just like that. E. coli, uh, because it was on the list, you know, E. coli, Wally, wa- you know, Wally was the computer, Wally, E. coli. So good uh, Really good idea right there. Unfortunately, this doesn't change the fact that the cashier is still very high. This was a nice observational type of imaginary observational joke when you go into these fast food places. How many times have you gone through a drive through and go, that dude's really high, right? So in this case, it's like uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Unfortunately, this doesn't change the fact that the cashier is still really high, right? So that's funny. I like the... It tapped into my familiar experience of going into fast food and seeing some of the employees there. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. While Chipotle is being championed as innovators in food production, advocacy groups are protesting their testing of underage robots. But that's mostly in Midwestern and Southern states. You can add that because we know if you're following a lot of the news, some Midwestern and Southern states are actually, like Arkansas, are actually cheering a court's a uh, decision to allow 12 year olds to work in factories. So really kind of bizarre. I think as low as 10, if I'm not mistaken, I have to look that up. But uh, good jokes, really good, creative getting in there and, and looking at the, all the possibilities. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Chipotle, um, it, will this automatically cut Chipotle's pitiful, pitifully, pitifully high price uh, side of guac in half? All right, Mayor, great idea. You have multiple things going on in the punchline. So you joke the joke, right, by saying pitifully. That's, uh, that's almost a, you know, it's uh, almost a pun there. But the idea is... If we look at the irony, right, George Carlin said, look at the disconnect between ideas and actions or ideas and behaviors. Like throughout human evolution, humans have had a a hard time squaring their morals with their behaviors, right? So isn't that right, Catholic Church? I think it is. 
Um, like the Catholic Church is over there somewhere. Um, but in this case, we can say, what if we use this and separated it as a tag, right? It's like, um, will this automatically cut, uh, you know, so it's like, we'll make a cut to make guacamole in half the time as a human employee, half the time. So they're saving money. It's like, I wonder if we're going to see that at half the price for the guacamole, you know, because isn't there, isn't the price of their guacamole, a side of guacamole, pitifully high? So now you could get the play afterwards, but make those, if you joke the joke on the way to the joke, on the way right there in the middle of the punchline, the audience is going to be stifled onto what they're supposed to laugh at. But if you separate the ideas and use one as a tag, then you could get two laughs in a, re in a, a similar amount of time um, without burying one of the ideas within that, within that headline, within that punchline, if that makes sense. I hope that was, uh, that might not as be as, I might not be using as much clarity as I need to use, but really good. I like this. I really like this idea, Mayor. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee, and they still can't catch up to Mexicans. <laughs> that was Daniel saying, meaning the Mexicans work really fast. That's a, that's a positive. Now, we talked yesterday. Anytime you mention race in a punchline in a joke, the audience is going to have this weird disposition right now, wondering whether or not you're trying to be racist. So uh, in this case, I thought it was a positive because it was talking about how, um, how, how hard they work. So, uh, you know, that's that but anytime you anytime you put race in a punchline your audience is going to go ooh wait a second is that you know what i'm saying you don't want them doing that you want them laughing unless you're intentionally doing that to get a play against them uh, with the audience and call them on their shit while you're doing stand up. Uh, I do that a couple of different times when I'm up there on stage. I play something to make them go, ooh, and then wind up catching them in their own game. So um, when they when the when they try to be too PC with me. Uh, so in this case, Chipotle is te uh, testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. CEO of Chipotle said, finally, a slave that does twice the job and zero talk back. I like that idea. That's a good idea. It's like that's what they're they're not looking to, you know, they're not looking to be more efficient. They're looking to save money. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. So are the brothels, uh, uh, you know, it's like, um, or so, so are the brothels, you know, uh, it's a modern day moon, moonshot. You know, I'm not sure modern day moonshot. I see what you're saying. Like the moonshot it's like, uh, now you're using automation for that. I didn't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the, this, this didn't really, really connect i think there could have been a better way to make that connect keith uh but um in this uh but uh, uh, why don't you take them into that imagine imagine the brothels imagine imagine the brothels being automated you know it's like i wonder if would people still pay for that you know sex dolls i bet you there is a brothel that offers a sex doll right it's like you got one that doesn't talk to you um, something like that. So Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Still takes the same amount of time for the food to give you diarrhea. Like this a lot. This is the best, sort of the irony, right? That was, you found the irony in the joke. Nice work there, Keith. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. This will give employees more time to gossip. Give the, give the human employees separate it. This will give the you know, human employees more time to gossip. Um, and it's like like yesterday, it was a lot of TikTok. More time to be on TikTok because uh, you know, everybody was calling out employees for spending their time on their phones. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Keeping with their brand, robots are organic and vegan. The, the, so make sure we know it's their robots, not robots in general aren't organic, but their robots. Keeping with their brand, their robots are organic and vegan. It's like, uh, I don't know, this, this one doesn't really eat anything, just machine oil. All right, here's a, a, here's a little note. Listen to your favorite host to learn their rhythm and phrasing and timing. It's like one of the things if, uh, if you're writing for late night TV, it's like get that host's rhythm. You know, a John Stewart, a John Stewart or let's say John Oliver, uh, John Oliver's rhythm won't be the same rhythm as a Bill Maher or a, a Jimmy Fallon. You know, Jimmy Fallon kind of talks like a game show host where Jimmy Kimmel kind of talks like he's like, He's kind of nonchalant and kind of running these silly gags within a monologue. So 
get familiar with your host's rhythm and timing. It's like one of the best things I learned when I was, uh, when I started out was the first lessons I was given was to transcribe a late night host's monologue, transcribe the five or four and a half minutes they're using as a monologue, then go in there and analyze that, that, that transcription, and then take some of those jokes and try to add your own punches to them. And that's one of the, you start to learn those rhythms. If you watch Bill Maher, Bill Maher has pretty every nuance that Johnny Carson had. And when I talked to uh, somebody who was his assistant for many years, he said Bill Maher learned how to write jokes by transcribing Johnny Carson's jokes. I go, huh, no wonder he has that rhythm and sound. So, um, but you're not, don't write jokes for yourself while you're writing for a host. I had one guy start writing jokes and was relating to his weight issues and the particular host he was writing for was Jimmy Fallon. Fallon doesn't have weight issues that are visible. James Corden did, uh, but he's no longer on the air. So uh, anyway, just a little note there for you. Hope, hope, hope that helps you out. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Chipotle decided it wasn't a good idea since the onions in the guacamole were causing the robots to rust from crying. So <laughs> I like that idea. I didn't even think about that. And I was like, oh, nice. He, you really imagined all the possibilities that could happen, you know, cutting onions or the onions in the guacamole. And you, then you said onions in the guacamole. So you had that in the punch on the way to the to the to the payoff right so the onions on the guacamole were causing the robots to rust you know uh from crying uh or you could say maybe uh, chipotle decided it wasn't a good idea since the onions and the guacamole were causing uh the robots uh were making the robots cry and causing them to rust that could be a different way to take it but you ended on the c word possibly thinking oh that might be the stronger word to end on so good work there chris Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. I told Spectrum I wanted internet service like Chipotle's guacamole. I was thinking smooth and creamy, but they thought they meant chunky and, and, and uh, they thought I meant chunky and inconsistent. There was another one that didn't have a name on it. Uh, it just had an email. Uh, but uh, I just want to say that's I like the pivot here. And it was like yesterday I talked about taking a joke, which the subject matter is Chipotle, right? So in this case, they pivoted to make the joke about spectrum, right? Which is great. It's a great technique to be able to use when you're writing. It gives you a whole different world of jokes you can write on a subject matter. Like if you were given a subject matter to write jokes on from the head writer or the host who says, hey, I need, uh, we need some more jokes on spectrum, right? And then, uh, so you're taking a current events joke that's about Chipotle, pivoting into uh, to Spectrum, and the punchline becomes, uh, like Spectrum's in an internet, chunky and inconsistent. And this made me laugh, because that's my internet provider, Spectrum, and my internet lately has been chunky and inconsistent. And, uh, you know, I live in a decent neighborhood, but there's always construction going on in some of these houses, and they say that's the reason for the, a lot of the service interrupts. But um, it's always something, right? So, but that made me laugh, the Spectrum joke. Good work, Anonymous. Anonymous. What if it's really anonymous and they're actually hacking into our joke writing uh, fun right now? You never know, right? Um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. I can't wait for the robot that doesn't charge you two fifty a scoop. Good one. I like that. That made me laugh. Uh, I think they're going to make a ton of green. Uh, a nice. That's uh, that's a that was a good joke too. And again, what was the name on that one? I don't. Uh, I for some reason didn't didn't make it in. Uh, I know it sounds like a good idea, but Hector had to put in a double shift to make enough tortilla chips. Now we came out of Hector, but I think that would work in my view. That I think you know. Um, but Hector had to put in a double shift to make enough tortilla chips. And so and once you in writing the punchline, once you hit chips. The brain uh, should tie you into chips, computer, robot, chips, circuit chips, right? So it's like that, that might may have triggered another joke. But um, the idea that it uh, sounds like a good idea, but now Hector has to put in a double shift to make an, could, uh, enough tortilla chips. Or let's make it clear. So what are you trying to say there that they're going to have to pay overtime and salary because they have to make tortilla chips now they're gonna have to pay overtime and salary so hector can put in it because hector has to put in a double shift to make enough tortilla chips right to match the output of guac i like that idea a lot uh, so realize 
sometimes you ask yourself in this, in a nutshell, what am I trying to say in this joke? And this particular joke is like, they're, you know, they're going to have to wind up paying guys double shifts anyway, because to make enough of tortilla chips to keep up with the output of the guacamole, it's a lose, lose, you know? So you could even do it. It sounds like a win-win, but actually this is what's happening. And once you point out that irony to us, that's where the joke is. Doesn't need to be a punchline in irony jokes. There just needs to be like a punch word. In other words, just need to be, we see how the ideas don't connect and basically we catch them in their own scheme. So their own scheme actually proves himself wrong. So, uh, so in the irony there, one thing doesn't wind up paying off for the other. That's where the irony is really strong. Um, so remember, an old man turning 98, winning a lottery, dying the next day, a la Alanis Morissette, is not ironic. That's coincidence. But an old man turning 98, winning the lottery, dying the next day because he was run over by the armored truck carrying all the cash he won, that would be ironic because it was the money, in fact, that killed him. Does that make sense? See the tie in there? That's the difference between irony and coincidence in a, in a sense. Um, testing, uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. So at Chipotle's, the robot does the first half of the work, then the human finishes it. Sounds like me every time my wife's vibrator runs out of batteries. <laughs> nice one, Tom. Uh, it's like, uh, the Aztecs, uh, so Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. The Aztecs name for avocados was Ahuacatl, that maybe that's it, Ahuacatl, right? Ahuacatl. Um, that's a word for it. That's their, that was their word for testicle. And it's obviously had to do with the shape of the fruit, right? Knowing that makes me kind of queasy reading about the robot cutting, coring, and peeling the aqua, the aqua, the aquacatl before mashing them by hand. Ouch. <laughs> cutting, peeling, and you can even just say robot cutting, coring, peeling the, uh, you know, the testicle before mashing them by hand. Maybe just like, I like that the avocado is a callback, but I think it loses the essence of the joke, especially cuts it off when we get to mashing them by hand. We want them imagining our balls being mashed in, in like that's that's what makes the joke work. That was a good research on that, Tom. You didn't just go for that. You, you didn't look at that linear headline skim. You went down into the depths and found the answers to that, you know, which I apologize to was somebody wrote yesterday about the Native American word. And I was like, I didn't know. I didn't know it was actually true. Uh, so uh, can somebody please develop a mariachi robot so that the band is that is ruining my summer dinners on the beach will be finished by ha in half will be finished in half the time love it love that concept right so it's like if we had maybe if we had mariachi bands were that were run by robots they wouldn't they they would ruin my uh, my dinner on the beach in half the time so that i like that tom good good uh, jokes there uh, good and tom had a whole bunch of them i just separate, separated and took three tom tom had like 10 or something like that on on the page Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. In a few years behind behind the counter will uh, be iRobots and the cleanup crew will be Roombas. Like that, Teddy B. That one, this is a nice three-way buildup. Uh, like what's next, right? If this is true, what else is true? Imagine the clean cleanup crew is, I like when you said cleanup crew, Roombas. That would be a nice payoff there. Uh, you can even take that and make it a stand-up joke. Uh, did you guys hear about this? Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. You know, wow. At this rate, a few years behind the counter will be iRobots and the cleanup crew. Roombas, you know. It's like, and you just drop your, you drop your, instead of, if you leave a tip, you just drop them on the floor. The Roomba scoops them up, right? So, um... It's like, if this is true, what else is true? Nice joke there. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Uh, I also heard that all Chipotles uh, with a drive through will be voice, voiced by Alexa and Siri. I really like that joke because it was, again, if this is true, what else is true? What would the drive drive throughs be like? Voice and hearing, you know, every time you pull up, you hear, you have arrived. Right. So that could be fun with an act out there. The other one I like is Chipotle is also testing out security guy uh, and there. Uh, uh, Chipotle is also testing out RoboCop as a security guard. I thought that would be that was a good tie in. Now, Teddy also submitted like 10 more jokes in an email, which says to me is really, really impressive and inspiring 
because it means you guys are cranking on your jokes. You're getting the concepts. Do you really realize how few comedians out there can crank out one joke, let alone 10 or 15 or 20 on one headline? That really shows that you're learning the technique of taking those two dissimilar ideas, converging them, taking the idea, expanding it with, if this is true, what else is true, using cliche reformations, analogies to expand your ideas, pivoting, using that technique to pivot and find a whole different set of jokes off of this headline, pivoting to an entirely different headline uh, and make or entirely different subject and making that pay off because it relates in one way or another to the original setup. So super impressive, man. Oh, I also like the uh, next thing, you know, R2-D2 will be taking your order. Now, if you could do that whistle, right, something like that, that would be beep, boop, beep, 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 beep. Right. That like that could be fun, too, if you could maybe find uh, a, some a clip of R2-D2. And if you can make that noise and identify that one famous little clip that he does and make that work, pay that off like so accurately, like when Jimmy Fallon nails an impression, he gets a big laugh from that. So if you can, you know, like beep, boop, 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 whoop, whoop, that means burrito bowl. Right now, I would love to see maybe you could do three of those, like three items on the menu and how would R2-D2, you know, ask for them or say them. That could be it might be a fun little bit. Um, so that's that's good. Chipotle is testing a robot or maybe even a C-3PO um, act out in his voice about, um, you know, when he produces the avocados, what would that sound like? So it gives you a whole creative outlet for that. Now relating it to you. Now, once you introduce R2-D2, what concept can you move on to to tie Chipotle to? Star Wars. So once you introduce that, that's now you have what's called a tag. Now a tag is new punchlines based on new information introduced in the punchline. A topper is a punchline, an additional punchline based on the original information in the setup. So um, if you have that, that could work. And uh, the, there's a, my friend in Toronto would tell you about that. He, he knows the difference between the two tags and toppers. Most comedians do not. Now you, now you have that information. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. This sounds like someone's dad justifying why they don't uh, why they don't have why they don't get Mexican food. Jay, I think there's a word missing in that. There's a typo there that um, that is missing for the word to connect. Uh, it's like this sounds like someone's dad justifying why they don't Mexican food. Uh, well, they don't get Mexican food. Maybe that's what uh, don't buy or don't order. Don't don't get Mexican food. Uh, be sure you check your text before uh, submitting your material. But certainly, if you're doing a packet. Make sure you proofread the hell out of that thing uh, so that uh, you can just limit or eliminate any typos. Um, and it's like here we're just having fun. So I get that. But just keep in mind, put it out there. Uh, let's see. We got uh, let's jump over to the chat here for a second. And whenever Farley say, hey, Jerry, sorry, am I late? Uh, you're here, Farley. That's all that matters. If you, if you have a joke, pop it in. Uh, or did you, and let me know if you emailed it, maybe I can jump over there at the end and find it. Yes. It's Jim McAleese, ladies and gentlemen, he joined late. And, um, this is a, this is a review from an earlier session, but go ahead and if you can either pop them in here, Jim, or you, it might be best if you shoot me an email so I can isolate it and find it better than scrolling through the chat because I'm not monitoring the chat all the time. So, um, um, so, uh, but, and same with you, Farley, drop it into the chat or even send me, send it to me in a text and I'll just look it up on my phone and then uh, bring it up live. Yeah. Uh, can we stop talking about a uh, ball mashing? <laughs> I'm hurting. Like, um, it's like, a, no, we got, uh, it was like, if you have some jokes today, uh, like, uh, you can drop them into the chat and I see if I can, if I notice them, uh, You'll get some feedback from everybody else in the chat too, so that's uh, also something you can you can depend on. And guys, that's the whole thing about this. Like, don't get me started on to to toppers and tags. I just mentioned that Jim McAleese, like you were the one that uh, shared with me the definitions uh, definition between tag and topper, and I think I got it right. I think you heard. Did you hear me uh, say that? Uh, the uh, explaining to everybody. All right, let's get back to Jason Rainville's jokes here. 
Um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. When asked if this will reduce the cost of the guacamole, Chipotle reps told us to get fucked. So <laughs> I would say make the joke about half the time, half the price, and then clarify it. Like Gaffigan might not say get, get fucked, but he would state the, the simple truth of it and then hit it with a tag. Like uh, basically, uh, you know, what would they, and if we were talking about robots, um, uh, they'd use maybe robot language to get screwed or get whatever, um, cut your circuitry or whatever. Like I think C-3PO said some things to R2-D2 that could tie in there, right? So, um, but as far as a joke, for late night, that might work for John Oliver, who uses language, or Bill Maher, who uses language in his shows. Um, so uh, that uh, th that's Jay Rainville there uh, doing some j doing some jokes. Always got good jokes from Jay. Uh, the robots creator said, "I'm glad my failed vasectomy robots are getting used." <laughs> but in this case, you got to let us know, right? You, the information of avocados being another word the word the original word for avocado the aztec word for avocado actually means testicle then you could have the robots creator said i'm glad my failed vasectomy robots are getting used but without that information we don't know the connection you got to make sure be sure to put that information in there right so a lot of comedians are so worried about economy for the joke that they're failing to put some ideas in there that help the audience to communicate uh, to help the audience to connect what you're trying to say so good work there jay thanks for submitting and playing the game um always good to see you uh let's see chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee are human employees the reason why guacamole uh, at chipotle is so overpriced so uh maybe maybe all right you know so because if that's true maybe we should be getting a discount right so oh if it's if guacamole is now this easy we should wind up we should be getting a discount on our guacamole well of course it's not going to happen right fernanda it's like because it's chipotle uh chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee if a robot can make guacamole faster than a human employee at chipotle that human employee must be a gen z i like it right because now you're saying that chipotle's robot is making human employees that was a really good, I pointed this out yesterday for a few people who were able to identify the simple truth joke that was hidden in that setup, which is the way the word, the joke is written or the setup is written. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. And meaning make a robot in half the time, it makes a human employee, which is uh, a lot of times, now keep in mind, the advantage we have as comedians is most of the world is super linear, right? They're so busy figuring out what the information that's being communicated means in context that they're not taking a, not, a moment to look at what the other interpretation could be. And that's where we comedians are, are, are superior because we practice this skill that they don't practice, that more peop most people don't practice, so we can identify those little moments. Like, I just shot an elephant in my, this morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Why it was in my pajamas, I have no idea. You know, that, uh, the old uh, Groucho Marx, Marx joke, right? So in this, that kind of gag, you found the, the truth in there, uh, which, is, uh, which is really good, good uh, really good work there, Fernanda. So Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. So you're telling me that robots are taking jobs away from Mexicans? That's interesting, because if a robot can make guacamole faster than Chipotle employee, that robot must be Mexican. That was a positive to the Mexican culture not a disparaging comment on the Mexican culture. So I think that is possible that uh, um, you can get away with that joke. But in late not, they probably wouldn't, but they wouldn't use that type of mention to anybody's uh, particular race or ethnicity because of uh, just because of the nature of the, the way late night is super careful with that stuff. Um, maybe if it was John Oliver, maybe if it was uh, if it was Jimmy Kimmel, Guillermo would say that joke. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so that that that's the way it would be able to be, tell that joke. But I like the idea in that joke, Fernanda. Good work. Um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. And 
Shal put a whole bunch of ideas on here, so I wanted to just sort of uh, get through this so, uh, with him because, uh, let's see, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Imagine a Karen complaining about her food, storming into the kitchen, only to find a machine making her guacamole. Who would she complain to? The engineer? Oh, it's too bland. Program some more salt in there. Uh, maybe robots respond with the same friendly tone when being shouted at because uh, because it thinks it, it thinks Karen is giving positive feedback. Allergies uh, could be a premise, maybe. Uh, oh, that's the reason I wanted to put this whole thing on because he was asking. It's his first time writing jokes, so he was asking some questions, and I what is probably and to me in my head it was the same questions a lot of people might have when they're writing late night type humor. Because remember, when usually when you're writing current events jokes, you're not necessarily writing jokes you have an emotion, any kind of emotional attachment to. It's not from your own personal experience. You weren't necessarily antagonized by an idea that you came up with, that you saw, that you heard, that you uh, saw a commercial and went, "Oh, that's ridiculous," and then you're making a comment on it or an interaction with a spouse or. Um, an in-law or a friend or an ex-friend where you can make a joke about it. In this case, it's just kind of a headline, topic line, and they, your job is to use the mechanics of comedy, of irony, incongruity, simple truth, uh, to find the joke. And in this case, he was asking, I wonder, can we? could there be a premise in allergies maybe? And I was like, great idea, because that machine is made with nuts and bolts. People have a nut allergy, so and then in there, I, I, he said, how would you put that into, into a joke, right? And so I said, uh, apparently there are no more people who are allergic to nuts and bolts than we think, choking on pieces of metal, fall, uh, metal falling in. So in this case, what I would do, as he said, uh, being a nut and bolt allergy. So I would use what's called the cliche workaround. What, what phrase are we familiar with? A nut allergy. And they'd say, you know, lots of people. So I said, you've heard of a nut allergy. Apparently, some people also have a nut and bolt allergy, right? So uh, uh, people were breaking. So some of the people were breaking. So some of the, they tested this guacamole on their customers. Some of the people were breaking out with, with hives. You've heard of a nut allergy? Uh, evidently, uh, when you use robots, some people also have a nut and bolt allergy. That's how you might put it in, consolidate it, and put it into a into a payoff line. Again, the audience needs that information. And saying the original line, nut allergy, and then saying nut and bolt allergy is a side-by-side -side compare and contrast with a cliche reformation. So that's where it would pay off. That's a great idea. So, Shal, really good work coming up with that. And he said another angle might be making guacamole shouldn't be the main aim of robots. Surely that's, uh, surely that's easy and can be bought and pre-made. Uh, bought pre-made. Even a blender can make guacamole. Maybe they should make actual burritos. I bet if you give a robot some guacamole uh, and uh, a meat, a meat and a wrap from Chipotle, it would shit. It would also shit itself. That could be, that could be. A, that's a fun way to put it. And I made sure it was like I tied it into. You see my words there are from Chipotle. It would shit itself, uh, meaning this is specific to Chipotle, not just making burritos in general. Uh, so really good, Shell. Um, and what I liked is Shell put in there, thanks for the videos. I'm writing this midway through the live stream yesterday. And so he was inspired by watching all the jokes. And this is what I mean about um, when I, you've heard me mention when you're, you've heard me mention that when you're in a writer's room, all the other writers have these ideas that you didn't come up with. And you're like, oh, and all of those are registering in your brain. So next time you're writing jokes, you're now able to take these ideas and maybe create more jokes like the pivot, like uh, using incongruity or coming up with a reverse or finding the irony in the situation, the disconnect, seeing where, where Shal went here by looking at a nut allergy, nuts and bolts of the actual machine. Uh, so good, uh, good work, Shal. Thanks for asking those questions. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Next, next, Chipotle's big plans are to have Alexa manage staff and Siri work the drive through Nice, Christopher. It's like, um, so Teddy B had a joke about Siri and Alexa at the drive through And it's like, Christopher had a joke about Siri and Alexa, but Alexa was the manager and Siri was working the drive through So it's interesting that the, uh, that, that parallel consciousness came and delivered a joke that's similar but different, right? So, um, which happens a lot in late night TV. Um, there was a joke one time on Stephen Colbert and George, James Corden back to back. You may have seen me make fun of that on YouTube in a short 
where they had things like something of Bernie Sanders and Twitter. It's like a, a Bernie Sanders is coming up with a dating site. It's um, uh, it's like it's like you um, you you know, at least swipe left or far left. And so that was the punchline. And basically, Colbert and Corden had the exact same joke, and they're on the same network. And there was like 24 hours difference, but they used the same joke. And I thought, guys, somebody's got to be doing some research to make sure you're not duplicating. Um, it's often, it's common to have similar jokes because the subject matter is limited, right? It's a headline that's out there that people are talking about. So um, that's going to happen eventually. But it's just so so you see that uh, that parallel consciousness is working there. Uh, Chipotle is making a, testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Unfortunately, the robot errors and uh, keeps trying to set the gluten free. I like the wordplay here. And it's kind of got lost because it was almost like making a, j a joke in the joke a little bit. But I like the robot is mis mo robot misunderstood the program, misunderstood human, uh, you know, it's not quite a human, right? Un doesn't understand all those nuances, those emotional nuances, the, the dietary needs and restrictions. And he was like, um, when he heard, he heard the term gluten-free, he tried to set gluten-free. Maybe do that to make sure we understand the difference between gluten-free and gluten-free, it's a paradox, right? So you're using gluten-free and gluten-free, setting gluten-free, same phrase, meaning different things at this, in the same sentence. That's paradoxical. One definition of paradox is two things that can't be true at the same time, but seemingly are. And double entendres, simple truth lines are fit into that category. Paradox makes the brain dance and makes us laugh. Uh, good work. Uh, pu uh, push yourself out of your comfort zone. Try the top 10 reasons you can tell your local Chipotle is using robots to make their guacamole. So one of the techniques to use in creating volumes of jokes is use the old uh, top 10 structure, which was basically David Letterman. We, we understood as, you know, David Letterman's uh, uh, late show's Basically, the most popular segment in late night TV was the David Letterman's top 10 list. But the top 10 list was actually a joke writing mechanism, a punchline machine for, for writers in a writer's room. Top 10 reasons you know Chipotle's uh, using uh, uh, robots to make their guacamole. And it's when you say top 10 reasons, the brain is already geared to write 10 punchlines or 10 reasons. And you exaggerate the reasons and you can generate a bunch of punchlines that way. And it's just a technique. Now you take those punchlines out of the list and you just use them in, in different setups. Does that make sense? So you're not definitely, you're not writing a top 10 list. You're writing, um, you're coming up with your own jokes in the, uh, you know, using that mechanism to create the punchlines. So it's one way to get the volumes of jokes is to use the top 10 list. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Does anybody think that's kind of crazy that a robot could be the chef? What if like the food was bad? Do you call the waiter and the waiter's like, I'm going to have to make sure to tell the programmer he'll fix it. It's like, who's the person that Karens are going to get mad at? Muhammad came up with a Karen joke. Somebody else had come up with a Karen joke as well. That's so interesting. Karens have come up, I think, four or five times yesterday. There were some Karens as well. So it's like, well, we get, you know, that still works, right? It's not... It's not dead. It still works. That Karens are complete. Well, who are they going to get mad at? Uh, good, Mohammed. Uh, it's like I missed Mohammed's jokes yesterday, and I apologize for missing those jokes. Uh, let's see. Chipotle is testing a robot that make can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Chipotle uh, are thinking about using robots as chefs, but what if it broke? And does the whole restaurant stop? And now they're like, uh, in, you know, now they're they're in the kitchen. Ten Mexicans looking at each other like, don't you know how to fix it? No, I thought you know how to fix it. So can we can't we can't so can't we bring the chef back? No, no, he's gone now. He's on the other side. Oh, my God. Did Juan die? No, he's on the other side of the border, you fucking idiot. So <laughs> he actually writes a, he writes a dialogue between Mexicans working in a restaurant. Now, this one, Mohammed, you have to be careful of. Um, it wouldn't work on late night TV, but it would work on and you know could, might work in a sketch on SNL if they were daring enough but um in this case you could do it as stand up you know when you start doing the vo voices of the 10 uh like 10 Mexicans are looking at each other like you don't know how to fix it no i thought you know how to fix it it's like let's bring the chef back no he's going to he's 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 gone now he's gone to the other side oh juan died no he's on, he's on the other side of the border you fucking idiot i could i like the gag there in the in the wordplay in the dialogue uh but um for a late night joke that would have just 
you can kick that into like a sketch that could work. Um, anytime you're writing a joke, by the way, people used to say, how do you write sketches? Where do your ideas come from? My ideas usually came from writing the monologue jokes because all of a sudden I'd get an idea within that monologue joke, just like Muhammad did. And all of a sudden this whole act out comes to me and I go, hey, we can put that into a sketch and it would run with the theme of the monologue. So now you have a nice, nice broadened out comedy piece to fill, this, uh, fill a segment in the show. Uh, so uh, really uh, nice work there, Muhammad. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee, featuring, well, get back over here, featuring new avocado menu, uh, AI guac, what a crock. Great, I'll get salmonella twice as fast, two different jokes. So featuring a new avocado menu, uh, like AI guac, what a, you know, so here's a comment. Like you, you said, um, this is basically what's called an attitude response to uh, the headline. A headline is usually written very informatively, right? So it's got a style. It's there to present information, almost like a news headline, right? So did you guys hear this? Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. and be like, AI guac, what a crock. You know, that's funny right there, right? In a way, because it has alliteration and rhyme. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel kind of kind of uses that technique. And then you have Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Great. I'll get salmonella twice as fast. And I think it was like, was it salmonella outbreak or was it an E. coli outbreak at Chipotle? Make sure you have that data correct. Uh, but that uh, in that case, it's Grant. Listen, Grant's an old friend of mine. As like, we go back, we go way back together. I think we broke laws together. I think we did. <laughs> Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. The project was immediately canceled after the robot reprogrammed the instructions to make guacamole with half a human employee. That's funny. That's funny. Now you just see like a torso up there <laughs> making the guacamole. That's a funny concept, Alan. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Now, if they can only figure out how to give that extra time to my asshole to keep working after consuming it, it's like, uh, that's fun. After eating it, they could give that, maybe make asshole at the end, right? So uh, it's like, now it's like after consuming it, maybe they can figure out to give that extra time to my asshole. Uh, sometimes an extra five seconds is just what you need and hope for. Yeah, it was a bad day. Now it's like that. He's basically saying without saying that he didn't quite make it to the restroom. So it's like uh, shit jokes don't always play on late night TV, but don't be surprised. They show up on Jimmy Fallon. And I remember a, a segment with Jimmy Fallon and, and Steve Higgins went, went back and forth for like three minutes uh, when uh, Carnival Cruises, one of their one of their cruise ships, uh, the toilets went out uh, for seven days on that cruise ship. And they were doing a bunch of jokes, uh, shit jokes to get back and forth together and wound up being a funny bit. Even though I consider myself a I'm not a shit comic. I don't know. I just found myself laughing my ass off at that segment when they were doing shit jokes. So. See, the, the, the man's morals doesn't, uh, don't align with his actions. Uh, so the project is under, so uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. The project is under protest by PETA uh, after following through with the lab rat portion of the testing. <laughs> like instead of, instead of avocados, they use the lab rat, right? Maybe that's what you're trying to say with that. Uh, all right, good work, Alan. Um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Unfortunately, the timing remained the same as half the employees already identified as trans robots. I'm not sure what that is. In, in this one, Monica, trans robot, be sure. What do you mean trans robot? To me, would be half robot, half human. But then if you have transsexual robot, you're having half or transgender robot, you have half robot, half human that doesn't not sh nor sure how they identify with their general, uh, with their uh, with their general, with their gender. You see what I'm saying? So let's be clear on when trans robot, that means maybe half human, half trans, because trans is a trigger word, right? It's going to it makes people go, what are you trying to say with that? And so you might let, take your time to identify what you mean by that particular line, because I liked that concept, because that's a concept that we run into in in a human HR is a human beings identifying as uh, as trans or making sure that the HR you addresses them with their proper pronouns and that sort of thing. So in this case, wouldn't that be interesting with a robot? How would that look? And let's uh, let go ahead and, and take that. I like that 
that premise a lot because it's a premise that we encounter. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. If the robot could talk, it would ask, why the hell are you testing me? And I'm faster. Why the hell are you testing me? And I'm faster than you. Lazy Americans. That's a funny line. I like that, Monica. Good work there. Uh, a Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Is it me or does Chipotle think they're moving bricks of cocaine? Like guacamole is good. But why are we, jo- I think, feigning for, for it like this? I think maybe jonesing would be the better word when you're really jonesing, needing, desiring, you know, like a like a druggie. Uh, man, I'd, I'll suck your dick to get some of that, you know. Um, it's like, um, uh, is this me or does Chipotle think they're moving bricks of cocaine? Like guacamole is good, but why are we jonesing for it like this? Where, you know, where, where, where we needed to bring in robots. I like this attitude. This is almost something that you would hear from Samantha B. Samantha B used to do a lot of attitude jokes like that. And this is where that sarc- deep, deep sarcasm comes in. Um, let's go back over to the chat, see what we got here. We have, um, um, let's see. Is it okay if I email in complete joke for us to work on, Jerry? Uh, Se, drop it into uh, drop it into the chat. Let's see if I get there. Can get there today. Uh, while we're here, why not? Let's do it. Uh, Emma, Joan emailed yesterday. Uh, emailed today. Hopefully, it makes it. I don't know if I saw it, Joan. If it if I don't get to it, um, it means it didn't show up in my in my list. Uh, so uh, let's see. So maybe maybe we can drop it into the chat. And we can work on it uh, together. Oh. Uh, who uh, who in chat actually been on stage for an open mic? Uh, so you know, I think a lot of people have. Uh, let's say like uh, I have about a couple of dozen times, but uh, then children, right? Nate, I totally get it. Uh, I have five kids because I'm half Mormon. Uh, the bugs referred to bugs in the robot design. Yes. Now the bugs could be both, right? In this case, right. So in, in that way, I, I was kind of reading it as a double entendre. And that was the one where there was like taking, smashing crates, right? Um, so I, but thanks for clarifying that. Um, is, is rhyme a, a laughter trigger? You know what? Um, it kind of is a coincidental trigger, right? So coincidence is a laughter trigger. And if you have rhyme or alliteration, if you watch Jimmy Kimmel, he drops in a lot of that, right? So uh, Bill Maher did a joke and the joke was um, his first one, his first show back after the January 6th insurrection, he did something like the, we started with a, oh, he says, uh, what a, what a year, right? We started with the flu and ended with a coup, right? Technically writing that the coincidence is it's true and it rhymes, so the rhyme heightens the coincidence, and that's where the laugh comes in. So, uh, and what a coincidence that the rhyme would attach to the reality of what just happened historically, and um, and he was able to get he got a big laugh and applause on that opening joke. Rhyme can be really really effective. So can alliteration, even though it's not identified itself as a laughter trigger, if it fits in the term of coincidence by the fact that it rhymed and it had a substantial meaning, profound meaning, meaning there was a coup and there was a long flu, COVID, and uh, they both tie in at the same time for this joke. Uh, that's where the, that's where rhyme can come and really uh, be really effective. Uh, so that's why you hear it in songs, right? You do song parodies. If you could come up with a punchline that rhymes with your setup word, you solve that puzzle in a coincidental way. And that's where the that's where the laugh comes from. It's a bit of coincidence is a form of surprise. But coincidence takes it kind of the next level because it makes you think for a second and go, oh, shit, I wish I would have thought of that. That's so true, right? So anyway, I hope that I answered that question for you. Let's see, Dice Clay made a killing with those. Yes, thanks for bringing that up, um, Al. Uh, these genders, wait till they see the robot, oh, when the robot, robot opens, what, what, robotal, robot, I'm not so sure what that, what that says there. Let me see. Opens a robotal, robotal, robotal. I'm not sure what's being said there. Um, Jim McAlee's three genders. Uh, that's, that's good. Steve, I sent the one about Spectrum, uh, cause the show was delayed, but due to your, in, due to my, in, oh good. I'm glad you sent that because I, I was wondering if you made that joke because you heard about the, it was delayed yesterday because the internet four minutes, like before I was supposed to come on 256, all of a sudden the internet goes down. I've got a red light on my router, uh, not on my router, on the cable modem. So it was like, that was wild. Uh, so thanks for sending that, Steve. And also inspired by that moment of writing the joke in the, in real time. Jim, sorry, Jerry, I have to go. A great session. I'll leave you with these. And he said, I'll leave you with, I'll leave you with three. 
uh, and I didn't see them. Uh, when do you think you'll be doing another joke writing challenge? I, I think uh, I'm going to be doing another joke writing challenge, challenge, I would say, in the next four weeks. I think I'm going to do one. Uh, I'll do one in September is what I'll do because I know my August is taken up. I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, corporates, so that'll be taking up a lot of time. And so then I'll, uh, I'll, and it's almost, you know, next week is getting towards the end of the month. And then, so I'll do one, I'll do one in September because uh, these are a lot of fun. And it really, you guys, it's, I'm blown away at how much, when you put that headline down for you to, to work on how much you guys just like, just start to really kick ass with it. And uh, I'm really amazed at all the all the work that came out of this, uh, the, all the work you guys are producing. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. I hope they're not American made. They probably won't show up to work. That's funny. So make sure, be careful with the pronouns. There. Who is there? Chipotle or robot? Robots. And I think make sure that we identify which ones they are. Because if we're sitting there trying to tie that in and we don't know yet, that's going to kill the joke. Right. It'll certainly diffuse the laugh because people go, what do you mean by that? So in this case, I would say Chipotle is testing a robot that can make it guacamole in half the time as a human employee. I hope the, the robots aren't American made. They probably won't show up for work. See how cl the clarity there just pops now. Just a, just a tip. Nate, uh, Chipotle is uh, testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Uh, I hate it. I can't throw my hair on. A, I can't I can't throw my hair on the plate for a free meal anymore. Uh, it's like, uh, that's good. I like that idea. I can't put my hair on a plate and make it. Act hey, I can't say there's hair in my feud, food for a free meal anymore. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Wow. Makes me wish I could find someone uh, easy to turn on and still make my food after pushing their buttons. That's good, Nate. I'm making a sexual joke. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. And it comes with a vir it's virus removal. Yeah, it comes with its own virus removal. They just throw the food away. So, um, so the robot, computerized robot, has its own virus, but it could go into the food. They just throw the food away. That's how they get rid of the virus. I think that's what Nate's trying to say with that joke. But it needs a little more clarity. Um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole uh, in half the time as a human robot. I won't read these all. I just copied uh, your email and posted it, Ariel. It looks like you like cranked out some jokes, which was awesome. Uh, so Chipotle is testing out, testing out a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Chipotle, uh, that makes them half as safe. So enjoy that extra iron in your diet. Um, uh, that's great, but it can wrap a burrito. Another burrito line came up there. That's interesting. Uh, you guys, like, can it wrap a burrito correctly? That's a, That would be the best robot, well, the one that could wrap that burrito so it doesn't burst open. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time it is a human employee. Still a little buggy. So if you see a roach, blame it on IT. And please don't call for the health inspection. So doing the bug is not a bu not a actual roach, but a, a, maybe a, if you see a roach, it's not it's not a real roach. It's a bug from the computer, in other words. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. That cuts down on wait time, but hits your wallet at checkout. And it was a, there was a couple of ones that uh, that I liked. I was like, can it, it can't wash its own hands was a good one. You can't blame if there's E. coli break, I break out since uh, a computer can't wash its own hands. Um, uh, let's see. And how about one that can clear? Oh, there. This the last one I liked a lot too, Ariel. Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time of this human employee. How about one that can clean the ro restroom that fast? So that's a nice sarcastic joke as to, you know, we've certainly been in fast food places and the restroom is a disaster. So um, nice work there. Let's see, going back over to the chat. Chipotle, Steve has Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. And when you come from Taco Tuesdays, you can enjoy your salsa with a robot dance off. <laughs> that's that's almost like um that's almost like a, a joke you would hear on David Letterman. You know, he goes into he used to go in these strange pivots and then that would become a theme for the rest of the show, a running gag, you know, robot dance off. And then the next thing you know, they cut to the robots dancing. You know, that's a that's a that's a very entertaining idea. Jim McAlee says the robots melt down, though, when they're programmed to brew instant coffee. This idea got a Yelp uh, from this guy. This idea got a Yelp like Yelp like from Alexa. Uh, Chipotle's secret ingredient to guacamole is to make guacamole, test the guacamole, then serve the testers barf as guacamole. Bad triple. 
<laughs> Jim McAleese also writes, if the robots drop the guac and the customer isn't looking, they simply reboot it. Nice, nice, Jim. Uh, Nate, with uh, virus removal, I was looking more for the food, always making people sick. Uh, so virus removal is just throwing away the food. It's like, yeah, but I, I think I got lost there, Nate, on like how do they detect the virus? Is that maybe they have a special virus? You know, if only the food had a virus removal software, maybe that's it because it maybe we put it in imagination because this would be that would be actually a good product for for Chipotle. You know, Chipotle spent, I think it was millions of dollars in fines for that E. coli outbreak, right? So they had an E. coli outbreak. They could have saved millions of dollars if they just had virus removal software for the food. So maybe clarify that a little bit. And that would be, that's a good joke because it really deals with a true, ironically, the true dilemma is not your computer speed, is actually making sure you have sanitary working conditions. Uh, so in there, you have that joke. Uh, I like that idea. Thanks for clarifying that for me, uh, Nate. Uh, all right, let's move on to some of these other ones. And thanks for dropping the, some of the stuff in the chat. It makes it very interactive and fun. And it's like, uh, once I learned how to use the chat, right? So um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can uh, make uh, guacamole in half the time. Whoop, I think I just went the other way. Hold on, let's go back to this one. Chipotle is testing a robot that makes uh, guacamole in half the time as a human employee, but uh, not until, you know, wait, wait until Sarah Connor finds out. So it's like, uh, that's good. Uh, going, now, this is Timo. Timo is actually doing a rewrite from some, from some notes I gave him yesterday. Uh, and really cool that you actually applied them and put them back in. So good work. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Are they going to put that tasteless green goo on everything twice now? That's funny. Um, it's good. Uh, good Because um, sometimes if they don't do guac, uh, guacamole right, it is tasteless, isn't it? So uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Not to be outdone, Burger King, mishearing the announcement, produced a robot that is twice as good at guacamole, which also makes uh, explains why their meat, where, the, where their meat is coming from. So nice work here, Timo. You did that move where you introduced a new idea, whack-a-mole, mole being an animal, and it also explains where their meat is coming from. Fun line. Good work. I like that. Um, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Yesterday's rewritten, but I bet when making guacamole, the robot is only half as apathetic as a human. <laughs> want to get right to that point hopefully the the robots ha you know only half as apathetic as the human so that would be like right to that because how many times we've been in a fast food and the customer service is so like non-committal it's like really do you, you you really hate your job don't you it's like why would anybody even go to it just like show up and work it as though it's a plus. Um, rewrite number two. Uh, Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. What's next? The robot's going to put on a leather jacket and sunglasses. And when it goes on break, it's going to go, I'll be back. So I think just you can you don't even need the leather jacket and sunglasses there. You could say um, uh, Chipotle testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. It's like, uh, you know, now when the robot goes on break, it just goes, I'll be back. That, that ties in to robot technology. Uh, good work, Timo. Like it a lot. And, and, and uh, good on you for taking those rewrites and putting them, taking the notes and applying rewrites. Let's go back. To, we got the chat moving around. Chipotle's secret ingredient guacamole. Uh, uh, like uh, Jim says, if the robots drop the guac, and uh, we got to that one with the virus removal. Joan, my guacamole at Chipotle had slightly metallic taste to it. <laughs> Then I saw that was made by a robot. They made it so quickly, I could taste the motorized seasoning. Nice. Must have been some, somebody had put in a joke about WD-40. I think that was Gary Weaver yesterday put in a joke about WD-40. And I can imagine that could be a problem when you're using machinery to create food, especially one that's got to slice, separate, pit, and uh, uh, peel. You know, you know, wait a second. At some point, there's going to be some some sort of like, machinery in our metal why are there metal shavings in this like there's like um there are machines in fast in like uh, breakfast restaurants that will actually peel an orange and then juice the orange so um so i'm not surprised they took that technology and applied it towards avocados um chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee it's faster but i miss the human touch literally no I, I miss the human touch. 
Nobody's touching me. That kind of, take your time with that, uh, Joan, because that's a that's a funny gag. Uh, taking the you introduced the cliche human touch or the idioma, idiomatic phrase, right? It's a regularly used phrase, human touch, and then you made it, a, you know, human touch on their food. But you're missing the human touch, which gives you a whole different play on that in your in your act out. I like that. Uh, it's like uh, Osam comedy says. Uh, uh, Asking some questions about getting paid in the USA. The price is the, the, the pay is all over the place. It depends on where you are, where you're working. Like Andrew Schultz, for an appearance, uh, his price is about $55,000. So for 45 minute an hour appearance at like a festival or something like that, Bill Burr is somewhere around $250,000 to $300,000. So um, Jay Leno, when he does his corporates, still gets about hundred to $150,000 per appearance. And uh, but if you're looking at like a one nighter comedian, you know, a headliner is making about 300 a night uh, in a one nighter, like a bar and grill type of situation in a college. It's a different story. Six hundred to three thousand dollars in a night uh, cruise ships. You can make about um, thirty six hundred dollars, five to five thousand dollars a week in a cruise ship. It depends. It's all over the place. Um, but that's a great question. It depends on where you're working. Clubs don't pay as well unless you're a name and you're a draw. If you're a draw, then you could do work a door deal. Um, it, it, it Gabriel Iglesias, remember back before he was super famous, was he when he was doing spots at the Brea Improv, um, that sits like 300 He had ticket prices up at about $40 a ticket to $60 a ticket. And then think about he did a door deal with the Improv and was going home with like $28,000 in one night. So um, it's all over the place, depending on what your celebrity is, what your draw is. Uh, a lot of comedians now, my student, Charlie Barron's, check him out at on YouTube. Uh, Charlie Barron's, B-E-R-E-N-S. He does sketches and little uh, shorts on YouTube, and he's become very popular and has now close to $2 million, uh, 2 million subscribers. He now springboards that into live appearances and is making bank at the live appearances uh, as well as merch sales and uh, ad uh, um, revenue from YouTube. So there's like all kinds of different ways to make money as comedians. Uh, and it's like, it depends on what you mean by, it depends on what gig you're in as a comedian, how much you're getting paid. You know, I learned that corporate was paying a lot better than the clubs back in the day. So I worked a lot of corporate gigs, still do, because they don't blink when you give them give them a price. They negotiate. They don't take it personally. Or they uh, sometimes you you quote a price and they go, "Oh, is that all?" And you realize you got to up your numbers. Uh, so uh, it's all over the place. Uh, but still, you can make it. You get if a lot of comics don't know what kind of money you can make here a lot of comics still work on you know take whatever gig they get and the gig's paying 100 bucks or 200 bucks it's, you can't it's hard to make a living uh, but you can actually go to other venues and find out there's much more to be made i uh, just wanted to share that with you guys out there um it's like jerry listing technique only useful for incongruity can be used for other structures Great, great question. Thanks for asking that question. Um, in fact, uh, you, I have a listing technique that I use to make reverses. We kind of went over that a little bit yesterday, right? In talking about the imagery, right? That people create when you when you create a when you say a phrase, like you say a phrase. My wife considers herself to be a bit of a wine connoisseur. Now I can list everything dealing with wine. And also the other thing is what kind of image did I just create for the audience? You know, they actually can make it, they make a picture of what, where the, you know, uh, of my wife, of where that setting is, um, whether it's a winery, a restaurant, a house, and it's always nice and stylish. So I can take all of the stuff they put in their mind and I can take it and flip every one of those and create reverses. So there's a listing technique for reverses. A lot of times I just start with a topic line I don't know where I'm going with it yet. And the, re and the listing technique helps me get there. I had a student, she was getting married and she was like, her fiance was from uh, Qatar or Qatar is how it's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, it was from Doha, Qatar, right? So where the World Cup was uh, being uh, supposed to be held, right? So, um, and so, uh, so in that scenario, 
she was going there and she wanted some jokes about uh, Qatar and about, you know, marrying somebody who was from there. And she was a blonde from Indiana. Right. So uh, so they met in college together. And so she wanted some jokes. And I didn't know anything about Qatar. You know, I didn't even know what it was. Doha, Qatar. What the hell is that? So I actually had to do being a white guy, an ignorant American. I, I was pronouncing it Qatar. Right. So and so um, um I wrote a bunch of jokes about that, but I had to look up the information first and list everything I could find about Qatar. So the listing technique is really effective when you're merging ideas or working on analogies. And it's also a really good technique for inspiring ideas. So, um, and, and there's also a different listing technique for building three-way buildups. So I share all of that in those, those structured developments and knowing how to develop that and having a formula for developing it helps you produce volumes of jokes. And I said, that's, that's one of the advantages of learning those techniques is that um, Bill Sheft, who was the head writer at uh, David Letterman for many years, I remember having a conversation with him about, he said, oh man, he said, I'm always glad I have 10 other writers in the room because on those days where I'm, I'm not producing. And I said, wait a second, you're the head writer. You have days where you're not producing? He said, well, yeah, don't you? And I said, uh, no, on the day, he said, there are days where I have headaches or not feeling well. He said, there's not a lot of them, but they're there, right? I said, well, in those days when I don't feel funny or inspired, I just rely on the mechanics. And he goes, what do you mean? So he didn't, he didn't know. He was working off instinct and intuition and sort of like just the idea of something being funny um, and he'd recognize irony and things like that. But when you get in and know the mechanics, that's when you can solve it just on the mechanics of a joke. Because joke writing is basically puzzle solving. And to, to know what the mechanics are gives you a really great place to start. So I can tell, almost tell the difference between the people who were listed in producing the material and the people who kind of went off just their instincts. Because um, they... A joke mostly is about solving the puzzle of the words that are in the setup line. And a lot of guys are coming up with ideas that were kind of funny, but not quite popping, right? And that's usually because they're working on the instinct rather than listing, right? Um, so just, I hope that answered your question. Um, so um, uh, let's see, Can, uh, Cannon says, uh, will there be another, uh, be, ever be an eight-week stand-up comedy course on the weekend via Zoom? Thanks for asking that, Canon. Uh, I might uh, be doing, a, uh, I might do that if that's something you're interested in, if it fits better in your schedule. I was mostly doing it on Tuesdays because that's where I did it for a long time. And I usually had my, uh, I had another, like um, another course on Saturdays that was taught by one of my other teachers. Uh, and usually Saturdays I'm out gigging. So if I can map out a section of time where I'm not gigging on Saturdays and do an eight-week class, I'll do it. But in, or unless I get a second instructor to help me fill in those dates where I'm, if I'm out of town, I've got one or two people who are really good who might be able to fill in if I'm, if I'm gigging on, the, on a Saturday and I can't make the class. But um, thanks for asking about that, because if, if I know there's interest, I try to fill that, fill that in the schedule. Um, so let's see. Uh, Mark says, what's the minimum amount of time you need to have a, start looking for corporate gigs? Um, great question, Mark. Usually... Shoot for about 45 minutes to an hour. But there are some corporates where you can get away with 20 minutes. It's a 20-minute presentation. And I find that uh, those can be pretty effective. I used to do what's a package called a laugh luncheon for um, like um, – uh, what were those uh, credit unions? Uh, my first wife worked with a credit union and they had a real pain point as like every quarter they had a new loan product they were supposed to pitch to their customers. And the, the you know, associates or the people working there at the credit union hated to have to do that. So uh, at the time, um, so the executives, the vice president and president needed a technique to help motivate their employees. So I pitched a laugh luncheon and the laugh luncheon was cater, cater lunch in, um, have a comedian do 20 minutes and then have the vice president or somebody step up and say, I hope you enjoy this. Just wanted to show you how much, uh, I you know, want to give you something special and now, uh, and then pitch the, 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 um, the loan product that has to be sold. Now, using uh, reciprocity, meaning they did something for us. Now we're going to do, we'll, we're now more, more vo motivated to do something for them. That really worked well. And they said their, their numbers uh, increased when they were using that little um, 
a little laugh luncheon. I would charge like two grand during the day and then have a corporate at night, which was paying me as well. So it was a way to scale your enterprise, you know, using that. Corporate's great, you know, and corporate's a, you know, it's um, once you learn how to write for corporate uh, situations, it makes all the difference in the world and how much money you can start making as a comedian. Now you have like, you know, you're creating multiple revenue streams. And I try to encourage that for all comedians because there is so much work out there. You know, we have no clue how much work we can do as comics. Uh, all we have to do is just investigate. I'll give you a quick algorithm. And this is how I discovered corporate comedy. When I went back to college, I, you know, I, I was think it was like 30 or something like that, 32, 33. I went back to college. Was it 30 or 28? Something. I would go back to Chico State, right? I figured I had two more years left to get an English degree. And I figured, you know, no, it was early, my late 20s because I was an actor. I wasn't, um, I wasn't quite working for The Tonight Show yet. So I went to, um, so I was an actor. And at 26, my hair started to recede. And I wasn't making that much money and anymore in commercials. So I was like, oh, baby face receding hairline. Shit, I'm Ron Howard. Uh, I'll never work again. And it's like, I have to become a director. So um, in this case, what I said, I'm going to go back to school, get my degree. And when I get my degree, I'll at least have a degree to fall back on. So I went to college. While I was in college, I was side gig. I was teaching comedy traffic school. And during one of my classes a Saturday where you have like 30 to 40 people one of the guys in the, that had a ticket for rolling a red light or red or a stop sign was the president of the local chamber of commerce and he enjoyed the class so much he said you're really funny he says look I'm the president of the local chamber of commerce every year every chamber of commerce has an annual dinner that's where they swear out the old officers and swear in the new officers and so I said, every Chamber of Commerce, he said, I would like you to host it and do 30 minutes of stand up. I'll pay you $800 and give you beer. And I was like a starving college student. So I was like, beer, I'm in. So uh, he said, um, so I did the gig. The gig went great. Then the neighboring Chamber of Commerce heard about it. They asked me how much I would charge to do their, their annual dinner. And I said, $800. So next thing you know, I take a, I go, how many chambers of commerce are there in the United States? At the time, there were 7,650, and I had a database of them and that with all contact information. And I wound up sending out faxes to 200 of them within like a 200-mile radius and booking 28 gigs in a three-month period. And I was like, holy shit, I'm rich. Right. So as a college student, I felt rich and I was realizing that these guys are paying me more than a club would for one night. And then I that be, that's before I even realized I can scale it or raise the price and also sell merch at those gigs. And so when I started doing that, I was realizing there's money flowing and it's like I've got a business here. So but what is a chamber of commerce? It's an association. How many associations are there in the United States? Over 2 million. So there is work for everyone at any time. Nobody's anybody's competition. So if you learn to work clean and like you don't have to always work clean. Like when I go to the clubs, I'm not clean. But when I do a corporate, I'm clean. So the thing is, be able to work clean. And it's like that's kind of the mantra I have. Be able to work clean because if you can work clean, you create, you, there's so much more opportunity to make money out there and you make it from corporations who write a check like it's nothing because it's not their more money, right? You When you're doing it like a club, it's some, you know, they're not paying as well. Or if you do it for a one-nighter, you got bookers that don't pay that great, you know, that high amount of money. But if you're doing it for corporations, they have no problem writing you a big check. So um, just so you know, that's that's a that's a route to take that can be really beneficial. And here's the best piece of advice I got in doing corporates. It was from uh, Al Franken, who basically said, uh, I met him at a gig a long time ago. He said, here's how you do a corporate. You do five minutes about them, and then the rest is your act, and they think the whole thing's about them. So it's just uh, just a little tip that can work out. I hope that the, that information is uh, uh, valuable to you. Um, well, there, let's see, uh, what's the minimum amount of time? Uh, uh, some comedy in a few days, I'll go uh, for auditions. What are some of the tips for beginners for uh, before the audition? 
I, I would say my, my best tip before an audition is to call a friend and deliver the material to a friend who you know is a, gives you good feedback or laughs with you while you're delivering the, uh, delivering the, the jokes. Maybe another comedian friend um, that is not going to give you too many big changes the, that you have to implement before you do an audition. Just sort of warm up. Say it a few times over. Make sure. Uh, n another thing, don't do new jokes in an audition. Do the jokes you know are tried and true that you've done before, right? So that you can do it like it's the back of your hand. The other thing I would recommend is um, a, a doing a couple of reverses right at the open, right? Early on in the set, three-way buildup and a reverses, nice, crisp, quality, structured jokes. Then you can go into a story uh, or if you're doing some story-based humor, but have some crisp jokes first. Otherwise, if they have to search for the funny, that audition's already gone. But if you can get in there nice and tight and open strong, you get a you get a nice you'll get a nice laugh from that uh, that audience, and it's a real guarantee. Something that tells up who you are and what your dilemma. Like uh, one of my students, quick, uh, of, he's got a kind of a nervous disposition, and he, he he kind of stammers a little bit. So if he's doing an audition, the people who are looking at his audition don't know whether he's nervous or whether that's part of his persona. And by th by three minutes, the time the audition is over, they don't have time to figure that out. So I built in a joke that talks about it. And it was basically, I, I know it sounds, you know, I've got this little stammer. It's a, not that I'm nervous. I, I actually have PTSD. Uh, my uncle got it from Vietnam. My uh, brother got it from Afghanistan. And I got it from Iraq. My mother threw at me. So he had a nice three-way build-up opening joke that got a big laugh, and now he addressed his stammer at the same time, and that was just part of his personality trait <clears throat> because he's PTSD, which gave the audience another reason to root for him, and then he got the audition as a, as a result of that. So those are the sort of the tips I would say for auditions. Uh, make, him make the jokes tight, start strong, end strong. That's it. Uh, I hope that helps. And auditions are auditions, man. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't, and there could be any variety of reasons you don't. And don't let it don't let it bother you. Or and if you're talking about auditions for commercials, the prep I would do is um, if the if there's a lot of copy, you can do some uh, you can you know memorize your first line, and then uh, so when you can you can if it's delivered to the camera, you can deliver it to the camera. And just the thing is with I think with commercial auditions, the thing that really helped me was when I started having fun in commercial auditions rather than looking, oh my God, I'm looking for the job. I need the job so bad. If you go in there and just have fun, that's where the payoffs come from, I think. It allows you to be natural and at least have an angle of some sort when you're auditioning. Um, so it's like commercials can go any direction, right? Now it's like as I'm getting older and if I let my beard go gray, I start to, um, I, you know, I can book some stuff. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm more interested in doing the comedy than I am doing commercials right now. Uh, but sometimes they come up and you do a self tape, but it's not for me. It's not been worth the time. But um, I hope that helps. Uh, I'll be interested to, uh, in the class as well. Uh, yeah, definitely, I'll, I'll I'll think about doing a Saturday class, an eight week class. Um, let's see. Mark said, "What do you know about getting your material played on Sirius XM? I believe it has to be clean PG. How does it work, and is it good for getting paid?" Um, Sirius pays by spins, right? So that's what they call them, spins. Every time you get played, uh, not a lot of money there unless you really become a hit, right? Unless it's a big hit. I don't think it has to be clean. I think it has to be, I think that the, what XM looks for in Sirius, they look for theme-based humor. Where can I place you, right? You know, where they're, so they, because Sirius does categories. So think about where can I place you? I would, if I was going to submit, I would do a whole bunch of socio-political material and then be placed in socio-political or political comedy. And then so at least they'd have a theme to place me with. Or if I was going to do dad material or family material or being a dad or having a big family or having kids or something like that. So give them a theme uh, that they can attach you with. Like they had that whole, the, like the blue collar theme. So the blue collar theme didn't just have the blue collar guys, Jeff Foxworthy and all those guys. They had um, guys who talked about I think Nate, Nate Bergazzi fits in that category because he's just a simple guy, you know, and he, that's how he delivers his material. So that's the category he fits into. So what I would do is study the categories on XM. I, they used to have a submission button that you could fill out an application and, and, and upload your, 
your audio to, and then they would see if you were accepted. I'm not sure if they still do that, but check it out. That's a good way to get exposure, and it gives you accountability to, you know, a goal to do something, right? So uh, I would definitely go back and check that out if I were you, see if XM does that, and see if there's a place that you could fit. There was another place that was doing that too. The, the other thing I would target for you guys is like dry bar. Um, dry bar, you need to be clean because it's basically a more, I think it's Mormon based, uh, outfit out of Salt Lake. Who's, um, who's looking for good. They're always looking for good c comedians because their job is to provide content and produce shows. And so, uh, they're always looking for new people to use. So uh, check out dry bar comedy and that might be an avenue to go. There's another one that was trying to get started at a Florida that wasn't, dry bar so you could have be a little blue um but um i'm not sure how how big uh how close they are to get, launching uh, but keep your eyes out there and look look at those things um hope that helps there um yeah dry bar is is great they used to have rooftop as well but i haven't seen rooftop lately i don't know if you guys know it's still out there let us know uh all right so um uh, better for you, but okay. So Chipotle, Michael has Chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. I'll tell you this headline surprised me. Chipotle about uh, real is better for you, better for the people, better for our planet. I don't imagine. Do, am I repeating this one? I think I am. Aren't I? Yeah. Oh yeah, I am. That's I must have gone all the way back to the beginning or something like. That. Let's see where I am with this. Maybe I just have a duplicate in the slide. I oh is that it? We're at the end already. Oh, and by the way, I just wanted to, did we hit everybody? I think so. Yeah, we got Timo. We got everybody. Uh, it wasn't as big as yesterday's. So this, by the way, is part of my late night comedy uh, course, right? It's part of the launch every year, like twice a year. I, I open up the course and, and do a sort of an enrollment period. And so I get people activated and doing late night jokes. And rather than going through the slideshow for you guys, I just want to let you know that, that you'll be receiving an email uh, talking about that and letting you know that opportunity is there and that's opening up soon uh, to get in there. And I'll just say this with the late night thing, the feedback I get has been, been very positive. Uh, and I'm always trying to do updates uh, with that course and provide new ideas, new approaches, new monologue techniques. Like Jimmy Kimmel has changed the style a little bit and there's going to be some updates there that talk about his style change and how to, how to write for that style change. Same thing with Stephen Colbert. Um, uh, uh, James Corden is gone. Uh, Samantha B is gone, and uh, so things have changed in the in the uh, late night world. But the main late night shows are still there. Plus, we have the daytime late night variety or late night style variety talk shows. Like Wendy Williams is gone, but I think we have. Um, and I forget her name. She was originally from The View. She's over there. Uh, I think it's Shirley. Is it Shirley? She's now replaced um, Wendy Williams. So there's still some activity down in daytime, right? So um, was it Brian Kiley used to be head writer for Conan. And when Conan basically retired, Brian went and he wrote for, you know, uh, for what's her name? Um, why is my brain going blank today? I don't know. Uh, uh, wrote for, Jesus. her... How come I can't get her name right now? That's so crazy. Not enough coffee today. Um, she, um, but he wrote for her for for, for a while. Uh, the gal who's mean to everybody is uh, uh, she got in trouble for. Her. Somebody's gonna put it out, out there for me. Sherry Shepard, thank you, Wendy. I appreciate that. Uh, Sherry Shepard, she's actually a really funny lady, and it's like um, I'm not sure how well the show's doing. I haven't tuned into it yet, but she's now. Um, busy so whenever farley says did you get my text thanks for reminding me i'm going to go to the um to the text and see if i can get farley's material out here so here's farley barge thanks for sending that farley so chipotle is testing a robot that can make guacamole in the half the time as a human employee we're going to have robot glory holes in the bathrooms at chipotle in the near future <laughs> i'm wondering <laughs> It's like robot glory holes what would that be like um i don't even want to imagine it's like um uh, it's like, I'll respect you in the morning. Uh, it's so important for me that, uh, my guacamole is emotional. It's like, so give us your take on that first. Give us a compare and contrast there, Farley. Like Chipotle is testing a robot that can make a guacamole in the same time, uh, in half the time a human, uh, employee. I'm not sure if I like this because it's important for me that my guacamole is, uh, emotional. 
or it's like, uh, I don't know about that. It's non-human uh, manufactured. I don't know if I can handle non-emotional or unemotional guacamole. So that could be... Um, that could be a, a good take on that. And that's an interesting approach. That's something I don't think anybody th thought of. It didn't show up in all the in all the jokes was the non-emotional approach to making food. You know, how's it how's the robot supposed to put love into the food? Right. So uh, good. I like that. That that works. Good work there, uh, Farley. Thanks for texting that to me. It's like um, it's a Chipotle testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. And then uh, a careful, careful observation, they found the solution was to hire machine oil fueled employees. Uh, it's like the, the last were guacamole fueled. So I see what you're saying there. Kind of good. Uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Thanks, Wendy. You saved my brain. Again, all of this data running through my brain. It shut off access to simple names like Sherry Shepard and, and, uh, and Ellen DeGeneres. It's like I had a crush on Ellen DeGeneres back in the day because we both like she started a little before me, but I was in the green room at the ice house and I, well, I walked in and I was a big fan of hers at the time. She had this little cute page boy haircut and I went in, I saw her and I was like, I, I, I was like, so like, Oh, it's, it's, it's Ellen. It's like, and then I, I do my set and she comes up after me and she goes, Oh my gosh, thanks Jerry for putting him exactly where I want him. I go, she likes me. And I went to the bartender talking about how I want to ask her out. He starts laughing at me because I didn't know she was lesbian at the time. Like I had a shot in the first place. Right. But anyway, so thanks for sharing that. So yes, when, um, um, Brian Kiley Whitney worked for Ellen, uh, and that's where he got his Emmy. So at Conan, all those years, 27 years at Conan, as head writer, never got an Emmy. But then when he went to Ellen, that's where he got his Emmy as a writer. So I just thought that was such a you know nice ending to a career. And I don't, I'm not sure if he's done yet, because he still does stand up, and a uh, very funny, great writer. So um, they found a solution. Was Okay, we got to those as well. Uh, fishing, let's see, here's something... Uh, Mark Randall, ooh, that's a great for me. I'm in the uh, Larry the Cable Guy vein, pest control, hunting, fishing, dirt road humor. Awesome. Yeah, definitely, Mark, uh, theme-based. That's a, And I'm glad you identified yourself. It's like I think every comedian should do that in a way, find out where their identity is so that – because people do buy off of themes, right? It's like where does that fit? Okay, now I got it. That fits here. If you're a hip-hop-based comedian type of uh, – uh, like if you have that groove going on, there's an identity there that can be that can be followed. If you use a guitar, there's an identity there that can be followed. If you do song parodies, same thing. Um, so the other thing I wanted to do here is if anybody had any couple of questions, I can maybe answer those before we call it a day. Um, but I think that uh, I think we got everybody's jokes in there today. I, and I really enjoyed that, uh, having you guys participate in that with me. So let me, uh, I'll go back to the screen here. Stop sharing the page. Boom, we're out of there. And now we're back to, where's the stream? There we go. That's me right there. All right. Um, so great. I'm glad you enjoyed that, Joan. Uh, and it's cool when we get in there and start like uh, sharing ideas. Oh, one thing I wanted to do, I think I got a... Um, I think I got a, a text, a couple of emails from people that sent some last minute jokes. Let me check. Teddy Bess had sent some extras. Now, Teddy sent some yesterday, but he, he got inspired by the, the group and cranked out 10 more. And so there was a couple of here that, uh, that had some good ideas. Like, um, did you hear Chipotle's testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee? I wonder what robots got to pay for health insurance. Instead of seeing a doctor uh, when the robot has a virus, he goes see he he basically just has to go to the Geek Squad. I like that idea. That's a good tie-in. Um. So and the the other one uh, it's like uh, a a nice little tie-in. He had pivoting to another topic line. He said, uh, Chip 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 "Chipotle is testing a robot that makes guacamole in half the time as a human employee." Also, in related news, Chuck E. Cheese animatronic band will be taking your orders. So I thought that was good to jump over to another fast food place or another identifiable brand that serves food like that. Now think about all of the brands of restaurants and that here's where the listing technique would also come in handy as pivots. Like what other restaurants, how would the robots affect other restaurants that we are familiar with that we relate to like that have things. Chuck E. Cheese is a really good one, right? So it's like um, McDonald's, imagine McDonald's play place had a robot. That'd be, 
That'd be it's like, a, ah, they named it Chris D'Elia. Don't bring your teenage daughters. Um, so uh, you have something like that. That could be fun. Also in uh, related news, Chuck, uh, let's see, the right people in Terminator would be making guacamole instead. Um, you had something about it. Instead of hasta la vista, baby, when you leave, they say hasta la vista, guaca, baby. Uh, eh, nice, uh, kind of a kind of a little punny there, but still, I, I, I liked you taking that risk and going that direction. Uh, oh, oh, it's like I heard the robots are even forming a union called Voltron, Defender of the Robots' Rights, said in the tune of Voltron, Defenders of the Universe. Uh, now, that's a little bit obscure, right, Teddy B? You love to go to those loves of those like uh, uh like the games the toys the 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 comics the uh the 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 nerd stuff right so it's like in that one some other people put some stuff in there about the skynet to relating to the terminator but without having us taking us through that context first you're going to lose a majority of the audience and relate to a small portion of the audience sometimes by the way in stand up those obscure references are worthwhile, even if one person laughs. But usually in late night, you're trying to appeal to a broader swath, a broader, you know, sort of like swath of people, a group of people, even if you're not trying to get the entire country on board. Like Stephen Colbert specifically leaned to the left and went after Trump when Trump was running for president and when Trump was president. OK, he's going to now lose an entire segment of his audience, but he gained real support for those people who tuned in. So it's a decision that you make in your in your comedy. Um, also, uh, it's supposedly his competitors Baja Fresh attempted to up the ante employee hologram. I, I like this idea because you were again going to a pivot to another use that as the tactic, right? To pivot to another familiar brand. And you said, uh, I heard Chipotle's testing a robot that can make guacamole in half the time as a human employee. Well, uh, Baja Fresh attempted to up the ante employee using employee holograms. Um, unfortunately, the customers saw right through that. So you have a little pun there based on holograms. I thought that was good. Um, and it's like, and then you had something like, I wonder if HR got to still do with sexual harassment with robots. I mean, there's going to be some time at work where you're, you know, you're going to have to twist the robots nuts. So I like that as a payoff, too. I thought that was uh, that was good. And you had a whole bunch of others. You had a Boston Dynamics reference here, which I thought was good. And um, so what you're doing is what I suggested is to push yourself, really push yourself out of the comfort zone and see what kind of volume you can create. The more you do that, the better you get at writing. Now, John Vorhaus, before I go wrote the comic toolbox, which is a, a, a book and it's a good book. And one of the things he says, when you're first starting is the first five years, as you're starting, you write 10 jokes, seven are going to suck, get over it. It's just the nature of the process. But, and that's for, for those people, for a lot of people, what I found in my classes, especially my late night courses and in some of my advanced standup classes, when I started putting up topic lines at the bit to warm up at the beginning of a class, Turns out like more closer to six to seven out of 10 of the jokes they were creating were good jokes. I mean, competitive jokes that could compete with guys who are actually who I actually sat in the writers rooms with over the years. So once you identify and understand the structures, you really start paying off with strong, tight jokes. And it's like I was really surprised and invited a few people that I knew from writers rooms to come see these classes. And they were like, man, the jokes these kids are producing, they're kids, they're young adults, but they're kids. It was like, they were really impressed. So um, structure is important, you know, and even though, if even if you're riffing, it'll show up, if the jokes only show up, the laughs only show up, if there's some sort of structure in in that riff. Uh, just want to share that with you. Um, and, and before I get going, I said, do you have... Um, yeah, yeah, I do have, uh, I think one of my a la carte classes deals with premises, right? And it's like, um, now, and I'll just give you a quick tip on premises. The reason I chose this particular premise, I had twofold thing. The one I did prior to this one, the first one I did, this is for Canon who asked this question, do you have an online course about coming up with great premises when writing setups? Um, so, uh, and Wendy said, are there any virtual options for your classes? I'm on the East Coast. Uh, all my stand-up classes, I have the stand-up class I do on Tuesday, that's on Zoom. I'm doing everything via Zoom still right now because I haven't found a space that's adequate enough and affordable. Uh, since I left my other space during the pandemic, 
the the rents have gone up fivefold. So it's and it doesn't make it suitable to be in a be in a spot. So if I can find somewhere I could work out a class, I'm going to be doing that live. And we I think we might have uh, be able to do a weekend workshop at one of the comedy clubs. Uh, but um, uh, but the other otherwise everything is virtual. I have the late night stand up course, which is online. It's a on demand course. Um, Basically, it's I've taken a lot of the live courses I've done, consolidated them with my own lesson videos within the course, and it's got uh, something like thirty-eight or forty videos, and it uh, go and also downloads and worksheets to to work on. It's a it's a it's a darn good course. One of my students take take it, and he is now in the interview process uh, of for the late night before the strike hit. He was being interviewed uh, over at Jimmy Kimmel. So, um, and another one of my students got on uh, Funny, uh, Funny You Should Ask is a writer on that show now. So it does, it has, is working for, for writers. Um, so the other virtual options I would suggest uh, is my Monday a la carte classes that I run pretty much every Monday. Usually I do 12 week sessions and take a break and those deal with uh, unique structures. Like for this particular last 12 week semester I had would pick individual structures and I drilled down on those for about three hours. And now I'm, the next session I'll be doing is going to be based in a lot of devices and what I call my how to write like uh, episodes where I take a specific comedian and show their unique approach to comedy and how to write like them. And you'll basically, you can learn, learn structure based on the structures those particular comedians use the most. Uh, so those are fun classes. Now back to the online course about premises and writing setups. The late night course is good to find premises because we I do focus on what makes a premise work. What makes a premise desirable for an audience? Because the idea is you want the audience to raise their eyebrows. You want them to go, oh, this is interesting. This is, gives me a reason to pay attention. It's not just a random headline. It's a random headline that creates some sort of emotion, either some sort of antagon antagonizing emotion, meaning confusion, excitement, um, somebody you saying to yourself, that's ridiculous, that's unnecessary, why would you do such a thing? Um, um, that's why you, you remember on SNL, they did that segment called really, really, you know, it's like, so when you hear something, it makes you say that that's antagonized, that's an antagonistic reaction to a statement, a quote, a theme. Um, so what makes a, a setup so good, something that addresses the fear in, uh, an audience, the emotion in an audience, curiosity in an audience Something dealing with shelter, money, love, sex, uh, desire, food, um, how to succeed in a relationship. Sometimes you hit those notes and people, uh, how, to win, how to get uh, b retaliation. Like somebody does something wrong to you, how do you pay them back? Um, it's like my ex who cheated on me called me on Halloween and said, Jerry, I don't know what to pretend to be for Halloween. I said, why don't you just dress normally and pretend to be in a committed relationship? So you see that benign retaliation that happens? We've all encountered that. We all can relate to it. And that's the other key thing. I would say that relatability, something we identify with, some problem we have a need to solve, and so it's something that we can that we can tie in and say, oh, yeah, I would like more information on that. Something like that. Uh, and I have to check out here uh, because I've got to take my daughter to her her drum lesson. So I hope everybody had a good time at this live. I'm glad you were here to participate. Keep um, I'm be sending you an email to follow up. And also there's some downloads in those emails. One is a reverse worksheet. The other one is the 13 comedy structures, nine laughter triggers. And I'll be talking a little bit about the late night course um, that's that the we're going to be opening the cart, the enrollment for. I'm happy you guys were here. So glad to be able to do this. We're going to do this again real soon. Uh, these are a lot of fun. So great work to everybody. Good, uh, good, uh, good jokes. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.